Greetings, everyone. I'm Karen Lawrence, president of the Huntington Library, Art Museum, and Botanical Gardens. And it's such a pleasure to welcome you all to the launch of the Shapiro Center for American History and Culture at the Huntington. When we first began planning this event more than a year ago, a virtual celebration was the furthest thing from our minds. The silver lining of our current circumstance is that we can have a large audience from the US and beyond. So welcome to all the participants. The Shapiro Center was established at the Huntington in 2019. And it was thanks to the vision and generosity of Dennis and Susan Shapiro. With the goal of advancing scholarship, knowledge and understanding of American history and culture. The center helps us promote the use of the Huntington's extensive and diverse documentary collections in the field. It brings together two remarkable collections, the Shapiro's own rare items painstakingly assembled over many years that document American presidential administrations from the 18th to the early 20th centuries. I say painstakingly because the Shapiros have described to me their desire to collect letters and documents that reveal character or illuminate a particular moment in history. Their exquisite collection testifies to close relationships, professional, personal, and familial between key figures in the history of our nation. These documents complement and highlight the Huntington's substantial existing collections in American history, started by Henry Huntington himself. Our collection includes significant holdings for George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, as well as the holograph manuscript of the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. The library's collections also include thousands of diverse voices that are part of the American story, including the papers of immigration attorney Y.C. Hong, one of the first Chinese American attorneys to be in the, uh, accepted in the California bar, and the Solana Reeve collection of maps which provides invaluable material for studying the history of urban development in Southern California and its impact on success, successive residential populations. These collections offer a unique West Coast perspective on the American project. In a moment when physical gathering is so fraught, it's fitting that the Shapiro Center will be program oriented rather than a bricks and mortar facility. The Shapiro Endowment will transform American studies at the Huntington. In addition to supporting digitization, preservation and curatorial activities, the center will host a robust program of lectures, collectors fora, research fellowships and exhibitions as well as the Biennial Shapiro Book Prize for a first scholarly monograph in American history and culture. The Shapiro's gift contains not only remarkable historical treasures, but also supercharges our ability to provide scholars, students, and the public with wider access to these unique windows into American history. Every year, the Huntington welcomes almost 800,000 visitors, with a quarter of a million people coming through our library exhibition halls and 2,000 scholars in our research program. So the Shapiro's two visionary gifts, their own collection and the endowment they gave to the center will touch countless individuals. The Shapiro's weren't just looking for a home for their collections they were looking for their collection to make a real difference. And I assure them that it will. Thank you, Dennis and Susan. With the Shapiro Center, we have an opportunity to examine in dynamic and critical ways the history of the US and its connection to the present and to reflect 
on the relationship between the country's ideals and its realities for an increasingly diverse America. This is something that our inaugural speaker today, Professor Annette Gordon-Reed, does brilliantly in her work. It's a particular pleasure for me to welcome Annette here, if only virtually to the Huntington, because we are fellow board members at the National Humanities Center. And I'd like to uh, just invite her again. We're looking forward to a time when she can turn her virtual visit into a real one to our collections. Steve Hindel, our Keck Foundation Director of Research, will introduce Professor Reed. By way of introducing Steve, I just wanna say that Steve, who's British, was so compelled by our remarkable holdings in American history and culture that within the last month, he actually became a US citizen. It's my pleasure to give you Steve Hindle. Thank you, Karen. It will be clear to all of you that we're playing musical chairs up in my office here at the Huntington. So yes, I did become a, a US citizen uh, last month, but I remain uh, a subject of the British Crown as a dual citizen. You might say that I'm hedging my bets for reasons that um, I won't, or perhaps don't need to explain. It's my privilege and pleasure this afternoon to introduce Professor Annette Gordon-Reed, who, as I'm sure you all know, is Carl M. Loeb, University Professor at Harvard, where she holds professorial appointments in both the Law School and the Department of History. Educated at Dartmouth and at Harvard, she's best known for the Hemingses of Monticello, an American family which appeared with Norton in 2008, which won the National Book Award, several other prizes, including the Pulitzer Prize in History, and she was the first African-American scholar to do so. Her most recent publication with Peter Onuf is Most Blessed of the Patriarchs, Thomas Jefferson and the Empire of the Imagination. Annette was Harmsworth Visiting Professor of American History at Oxford University in 2014 to 15, has been the recipient of the MacArthur Genius Award, and is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. We are thrilled that she accepted our invitation to inaugurate the Shapiro Center. So to discuss the past in the present, America's founding and us, please welcome Professor Annette Gordon-Reed. Annette. Thank you very much for that introduction. And congratulations to you. I didn't know that. That was a surprise. Um, wonderful to have you aboard. And I would also like to say how deeply honored I am to inaugurate uh, this series. It's a wonderful opportunity anytime I get to address people at the Huntington. I've actually been there and I do look forward uh, to the opportunity, Karen, to come back there in person because it's a beautiful, beautiful place. I'm happy to talk to people in this very interesting times on this very interesting manner in which we're doing this, we all understand why this is, has been made necessary. And I have been asked very much over the past several months, since March really, have we ever experienced a time like this in the country? People look to historians to try to make some connection from past to the present. And we have certainly been through pandemics. There was the Spanish flu crisis um, in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, certainly the 1840s and the 50s, the run up to the Civil War was the time of great partisanship. The 1790s, the period of time that I studied, the early American Republic saw lots of partisan strife and there was a question whether the country would survive. And certainly in the 1850s, we actually came to Civil War. We're not at that point. The extreme partisanship we have today is not hopefully at the point that something like that happens. We've also been through periods of economic depression and certainly the situation now with the economy and job loss and so forth is reminiscent of what happened in the 30s. What is interesting about this particular moment is that all three of these things are happening together. So in a way, it makes for a somewhat unique experience. And I've also been asked why there was such a profound and a large response to the killing of George Floyd. That particular moment created something, not just a ripple effect, not just in the United States, but all over the world as people responded to the video of Floyd being killed by a police officer and police officers. And 
we've seen videos like that before. Certainly, technology has made it possible for people to use their cell phones to record those kinds of activities, things that were usually just described in police reports or in court cases. And people actually got to see how some police officers deal with suspects. And for whatever reason, that particular event galvanized people. I had my own theory about it that I've suggested that COVID, which has required us to be indoors, which has given us a lot of time on our hands to actually read and think about things, and has also compelled us to think about one another in ways that we don't typically have to think about one another. Social distancing, wearing masks, thinking that we're part of a particular effort, a common effort at facing a common peril. Perhaps I wonder if that has not influenced the way we saw the Floyd uh, situation. But whatever it is, we're in a moment now when the words Black Lives Matter, which have been on the lips of people for a number of years now, actually seem to go even further, definitely went further in this country and all over the world. I never thought I would see thousands of people in the United States, in every state of the union, and all over the country, all over the world, marches proclaiming Black Lives Matter. Now this is important for a number of reasons. One of the things that we have talked about in the past few months is this notion of a racial reckoning in the United States, that we try to think about how the legacies of slavery propped up a system of white supremacy, propped up a racial hierarchy because slavery was racially based in the United States, which it had not been as a part of, of history. I mean, there've always been slavery, but racially based slavery where people were born and their children were in that state because of their race is something that shaped American life. And coming to grips with that requires thinking in a very, very serious and concerted way about the lives of people who made the United States of America, helped to create the United States of America. As we've been thinking about Black Lives Matter, focusing in, in the main, on police reform and changing the attitudes about African Americans as citizens, this has sort of bolstered the discussion that had already been under the way about monuments, about names of institutions, naming institutions for famous figures of the past, political figures of the past, like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. This has been a debate that's been going on before this particular moment, but I do think thinking about Black Lives Matter as a concept, thinking that this means something more than just how you deal with police, but Black citizenship overall necessarily brought this conversation, I think, about the founders back to the fore. This really got started in a major way when people were complaining about the presence of Confederate monuments, Confederate icons in the public sphere, on the public in public spaces throughout the country in the South and actually in other parts of the country as well. Certainly the situation, the, the tragedy in Charlestown when people were killed in the church by a person who had in his home and on websites Confederate memorabilia, that galvanized people as well. The marchers in Charlottesville who marched towards the statue of Jefferson at one, in, in one infamous evening with the goal of the next day, protecting a statute of Robert E. Lee, also brought this to the fore. People talk about this quite a bit. And that had not died down, but it was given new life. These kinds of questions were given new life over the past six or seven months. And there has been concerted effort on the part of people to make the argument that not only should we get, uh, get rid of Confederate monuments, or we think about the Confederates in a different way, we should think about members of the founding generation in a particular way as well. You know, I was quoted as saying during this time period that there was in my mind a distinction, a distinction could be, distinction could be made between the Confederates and the founding generation, members of the founding generation that there's a difference between being a member of a group of people who wanted to destroy the United States 
and the group of people who wanted to create the United States. We are still living with the legacies of Jefferson and Washington in good ways and bad, and I'll get to that in a moment. But with the Confederates, the Confederates ideal, as stated in their founding documents, the Constitution of the Confederacy, the so-called cornerstone speech by the Vice President of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens, who basically said, simply said, actually, that African slavery was ordained by God. It was something that was natural, that it was the state, the natural state of African people to be the slaves of whites, and that that was the cornerstone of the Confederacy, that that was the whole basis of their society. In this document, the Cornerstone speech, he rejects the Declaration of Independence, the part of the Declaration of Independence that said all men are created equal. He said that Jefferson and members of the founding generation were wrong about that. He actually calls Jefferson out specifically on this particular point to say that the Confederacy was based upon something different than that, on the opposite uh, to what the all men are created equal stood for, that that language stood for in the Declaration of Independence. So, and the, Federal, and the uh, Confederate Constitution specifically ordained slavery and protected slavery openly, not in a sort of indirect way, which our Constitution does, and perhaps we could talk about that later on. But here you have a group of people who had values that were antithetical to what we say we believe today, and that, so therefore, to my mind, grouping them in with people who created the United States, Jefferson writing the Declaration of Independence, George Washington being what some people call the indispensable man, the person who united, who was the only person who apparently was able to unite all 13 colonies to go against the largest and the greatest power um, country on earth at that particular moment, in the European sphere, I could say. Those two people should be seen differently from the Confederates. Now, I somewhat confidently predicted that because it wasn't apparent to me, and it still isn't clear to me now, <laughs> that an argument could be made that these two people, that these two groups of people were the same or similar, should be treated in the same particular way. The Confederacy was a moment in our history. Uh, compare it to a river. If you think of a river flowing, it was a branch that went off into nowhere, essentially. And some of the ideals, the greatest ideals that came from the American Revolution continue with us. We still use the Declaration of Independence. Every group that has existed in the country that has tried to make a place for itself in this country have used the Declaration of Independence to make that place. That is a contribution that I think merits commemoration. What do I mean by commemoration? It doesn't mean hero worship. We could have a statue of someone, you can name an institution after someone without hero worshiping that individual. History is not about our favorite people, the people we want to have a beer with or a glass of wine with, although some people certainly think about doing that with Jefferson or Washington. That's not something that I do, but the, the notion is that history is about the people who have made contributions, have helped shape who we are, people that we have to deal with in a rational, in a realistic fashion, not, as I said, not hero worshiping. It is possible to have a statue of Jefferson. It is possible to have a school named after Jefferson. So long as you tell the truth about Jefferson and all aspects of Jefferson's life. The same goes for George Washington as well. I, I group them both as problematic figures. Uh, for whatever reason, and I think it's probably because of the Declaration, Jefferson comes in for more criticism than other members of the founding generation who were slave owners as well. Washington gets something of a pass on this because he did, upon his death, provide for the freedom of those enslaved people at Mount Vernon, Mount, Mount Vernon for whom he could uh, provide freedom. Many of the enslaved people there were dower slaves connected to his wife and he couldn't legally uh, free them, but he did do that. Jefferson did not. 
So that is a distinction that is made between the two of them. People say, well, you can't really group them together. I'm very glad that Washington freed his slaves, the ones that he could, um, but freeing people upon your death was not, was not the best way to do that. I mean, in fact, he was criticized by some people who, at the time who were for more immediate abolition of, 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 of enslaved people by saying that he should have done that while he was alive, that that's the moment to free your slaves. There hasn't been anybody, I think, in the world, anybody in the United States, I should say, who had more moral capital and political capital than George Washington. Not at the time and not now. He was, univer well, the Jay Treaty was problematic, but overall, he had more political capital and moral capital than any other politician uh, at, at the time. And his doing that in freeing enslaved people while he was alive, many people thought could have made a difference. It's not the case with Jefferson. Jefferson died, uh, we believe, $107,000 in debt. He would not have been able to free his enslaved people if he wanted to, which he did not want to do because he did not believe in those kinds of private emancipations. He thought that society as a whole should free, uh, free, should free black people, not, not individual people, that that was just sort of a, a feel-good measure on the part of people. But so he would not have done it even if he could, but he could not have because of his financial situation at the end of his life. So that makes a difference. He did not free enslaved people. But both of these men participated in this system for many, many years. And both of them could be criticized for that and should be criticized for that. That can take place while we recognize the contributions that they made to the country. So I have always separated those two people out, those groups of people out from the Confederates. There are some people who don't think that the distinction, it makes any difference at all that anybody who owned enslaved people should not be honored. But for my mind, recognizing these people and their contributions is a part of being faithful to the history of the country. Commemorating, to my mind, does not, does not mean hero worship. So we deal with problematic figures in the past not by disappearing them, although some of them can be disappeared if the values that they put forth are no longer values that guide us. And as I said, I don't believe, maybe there are for some people, I don't believe the values of the Confederacy are what we would consider to be American values at this particular time. And some people disagree with that, but this is, this is the discussion that we have to have about these kinds of figures. And I think it should be a subject of discussion, not just a matter of pulling down statues. There has to be a conversation about this, about these particular people on an individual, on a case by case basis, on an individual case by case basis. Does this person contribute to values that we hold dear with even with their problems? And that's the kind of discussion we want to have. I've been involved in this for a number of, well, a few years from now, as a matter of fact, when the question of Woodrow Wilson came up at Princeton and the question of John Calhoun at Yale. I actually talked to people at Yale about this. And the idea was what we have to do is to have the discussion we talked about, to have some sort of principle basis for thinking about whether or not the person fits the criteria, the, the contributions fit the criteria as being criteria that advance American values. John Calhoun, who did not, you know, certainly who was the architect of what we could call pro-slavery ideology, would be someone to, to my mind, and this is what I told him, did not fit that criteria. He is not giving us something that contributes to bolstering the ideals that America hold, hold, holds dear. In a diverse country, you have to have some kind of give and take on these particular questions. And the give and take has to be done on the basis, as I said, of American values, notions of equality, 
notions of fairness, due process, notions of anti-racism, because you can't have the, the notions of white supremacy, even though that has been a part of American history from the beginning, some, some people's ideas are not in keeping with where we want to go for the future. So these are difficult questions. It's not an easy thing to work out, but they have to be worked out. And a lot of this comes, the main thing that we have to remember is that it's very, very difficult to integrate people, to have an inclusive society and keep everything the same. If black lives really matter, that means you have to think about how it feels to be a person who walks to a courthouse and sees a statue of someone who proclaimed them inferior and wanted to keep them down and wanted to keep them enslaved. The very opposite of any notion of justice. What it means to have those kinds of people honored in places that are public. I'm not talking about cemeteries or battlefields or things like that that are appropriate uh, for Confederates and Confederate monuments and Confederate memorials and so forth. People can do those kinds of things, but we have a long way to go in this country to think, of, to, to think about ways to bring people together, to think about respect for others, one another and our differences but at the same time, understanding that we're Americans and we do have a shared past. It's not always been a pretty situation and it's not always a happy story, but history, as I said, is not just about our, the things that make us feel good. It's about the things that happen and things that have helped shape us and things that we wanna continue and go forward with. I think that members of the founding generation for many of their flaws, and particularly the one that I wrote, write about the most, have contributed to something that we cannot forget, something that is continuing, something that has made us who we are today. And we don't, I don't think we do ourselves justice if we don't grapple with them as adults, understanding that flawed individuals can bring forth good things and good things don't necessarily mean perfection. That perfection is something that is not, is not a human quality and none of the founders were, were perfect people, but we can only do this. We can only go forward if we're honest about our past, the good parts and the bad parts. And that's a conversation that we're going to be having now. We're in an election year. We're going to see what happens uh, over the next few months. It's an interesting time to be a historian. Uh, not so great a time uh, to be, uh, well, I, I guess it's, it's a nervous time. It's a nerve wracking time. These are interesting times. And it would be wonderful to see what people make of what has happened, which is what historians make of what has happened over the past six, six months. But I do know that we'll be better off for the conversation that I, I am certain we're gonna be having. Young people are gonna make us have this conversation and we'll see who is left standing, I hope that there will be some recognition of the contributions of the founders. And I hope there will be contextualization of their lives and the reality of the bad things that they did as well as the good. So with that, I would like to take your questions. Oh, actually, I'm supposed to have a conversation with Steve. Thank you so much, Annette, for those thoughtful and nuanced uh, comments. There are so many themes that I'd like to pick up on with you over the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes. But we will obviously give a large audience the opportunity to ask questions from the virtual floor. Mm -hmm. So as Annette and I are having our fireside chat, perhaps out there, you would like to use the Q&A function on the bottom right hand side of your Zoom screen to submit questions. And we'll get to those in, in due course. Can I take you back, Annette, to the premise of your presentation and a term that you use both during the talk and in the publicity for it beforehand? And that's the reference to Jefferson and Washington in particular as problematic. <laughs> How would you respond to critics who would argue that the use of the term problematic to describe the Founding Fathers is in fact itself divisive? Well, that's a, that's a historical 
just throwing a sort of fudge word here uh, to try to describe what you mean. I, I think it's, it's divisive, but it's the truth. I mean, it's very, very hard to go to Monticello and to Mount Vernon and to see this beautiful place and to see the wealth and the power that it represents without recalling that they're slave plantations. Right. And there is a problem with the kind of, as I said, hero worship or moving in, at veneration, un, unexamined veneration of people who owned other human beings. And one of the things that I, I've discovered as I've been talking about this over a few months is how inured I am to that. Right. You know, I read the Jefferson's farm book and I read his letters and I see all the records talking about enslaved people. And I know it's bad. <laughs> I know that this is a tragedy in lots of ways, but it's interesting to see it through the eyes of people who don't do that, who right. don't read, who are not historians and who don't read these documents all the time and to see the shock. I mean, they know that there's slavery, but when you talk to, when they think about it specifically, it's a real problem for them. So I don't, need, I don't know any other way to, to describe it except to say that this is not like, these are not sort of ordinary run of the mill uh, flaws in a way. This is something that, this is a way of life that's hard for us to imagine. Right. And um, the difficulty with, hum, with, with historian, being a historian, particularly talking about individuals, right. is how you present their world that makes total sense to them. Right. And to us, it's just unfathomable. Right. You know, so it's, it's there's no other way around it. No. One of my uh, great academic heroes, the late great Edward Thompson, once wrote that the discipline of history is the discipline of context, which is, I took to mean that uh, we should always interpret actors and actions in the past in terms of their own time and not by our own standards. Mm -hmm. But do you think that uh, there are some historical phenomena that really require our moral judgment? Oh yeah, I think history is a moral enterprise. We can't just say, oh yeah, and this is how they slaughtered the Andersons and they just used to do that. Um, no, we're gonna make some form of judgment about people. But the difficulty is it's a delicate balance. There is no precise alchemy for a formula for how to do that. And you sort of know it when you see it. You can't just, you know, say Washington sells some um, enslaved person who had done something. I mean, he sells people to the Caribbean, which is basically their ceiling their, their, to their death, essentially, right. is what this is. And um, Jefferson at one point I was right, working on the Hemings as a Monticello and I was writing of, about the story of Mary Hemings who when Jefferson comes back from Paris, she, he, she asked him to sell her to Thomas Bell, the, the white man that she's living with and having kids with. He sells the children, the Bell children, and but the older children he keeps at Monticello and they were 14 and 12. And I, I'm writing them, sitting in my office writing and all of a sudden I started crying because I thought about my children and I thought about when they were 12 or 14, they wouldn't have wanted to be separated from me. Now, I mean, Charlottesville was about three miles from Monticello and it was, people went back and forth, but still, I mean, that, those kinds of moments, you, you can't, that's a human reaction to that. Empathy. And that's, it's a strong enough one that you have to, you have to bring that forward somehow to remind people, this may be how Jefferson thought about it, but what about, <laughs> what about Joseph and, and Betsy? And when they say the members of their time, they shared the time with Jefferson and I'm sure they did not want to be separated from their mother. Right. So there are people too. So whose time, you know, whose perspective? So what my job is to try to, so it's not like you're, you know, you're, you're judging people, but what you're really doing is you're saying, here's Jefferson's perspective right. and here's 
their perspective and you know the, the perspective of people who are uh, of a family so you have to do both of those things and the reader right. can decide with whom they identify interesting so can we turn then specifically to jefferson himself then you turn you make the distinction between alexander stevens and mm -hmm. jefferson and mm -hmm. the arguments that uh the confederacy was a dead end but jefferson's legacy has been something Mm -hmm. much more positive. How would you counter the charge that Jefferson doesn't have the courage of his convictions and that he's a hypocrite when it comes to his attitudes to slavery? Well, I think Jefferson had no idea what to do about slavery. I mean, as a young man, you know, he saw himself, he's like a young person who thinks that he's really progressive and, you know, he's, he's for science, he's, yeah. you know, uh, not anti-religion, but you know, skeptical of organized religion, right. anti-monarchy, and anti-slavery, right? Uh, he makes some moves towards anti-slavery stuff as a young man that go nowhere. And then he became interested in the revolution. And that was the guiding principle of his life, was the United States of America. That was the thing that galvanized him. Slavery goes to the back burner, and he basically says, there's nothing I can do about that. Now, he did not think that there was what he would call a Republican, with a small, small r, answer to slavery. And once he knows that Virginians are not going to vote slavery out, he leaves that alone and goes to his other things. I mean, the, I've, there's not one letter. All of Jefferson's comments about slavery after he comes back from France are in response to people's questions to him. He's not bringing this up to talk to other people about it. And I think what has happened is that his writings against slavery in the notes made later his, made historians, some historians portray him or people portray him as this great anti-slavery champion. And he never claimed to do that. Those are, just, he never, claim that for himself. He would say, I'm a revolutionary. I am, you know, science. I'm all the, and he'd say I'm anti-slavery, but that was not, that was not a big part of his life. And so I think he has suffered because of what has been made of the things that he said. Right. Uh, and this was never on the front burner for him at all. You know, I think he thought slavery would probably end that by the time we get to Missouri, and Missouri conflict, slavery is going to end with a war. Right. And that would never be something that he would say, oh, this, we're going to go to war to end slavery. That was never in the cards for him. Interesting. Can we turn in particular to his relationship with Hemings, about which you've written so uh, powerfully and, and eloquently? Um, you were once quoted as uh, supporting the view that recognition of the reality of the Jefferson Hemings relationship was a way of establishing black people's birthright to America. Do you still believe that, uh, that it was a gesture of inclusion in that way? Um, no, I, I would say that people took it that way. I mean, I don't remember, I mean, that that's the way people ha have seen it. I think, I think what I meant was, if I can go back to think of what I was, who I meant when I said that, um, <laughs> is that people had to think about slavery in a different way with that. I mean, if it means a founding father, if you had a liter a founding father who was literally, actually, I should say, actually the father of non-white people, right. that changed the way people would see the founding. I think um, you, can't, you can't go to Monticello now, or you can't think about Monticello now without thinking about enslaved people in relation to Jefferson. And when I remember someone said to me the day after this, the DNA yeah. uh, results were announced, it was a, a journalist who shall remain nameless, was doing an interview and he said, I never thought of Jefferson as a slaveholder until now. Right. And I thought, that's sort of <laughs> interesting. You know, why, you know, why not? How, why, why did this make you see that? And there's something about the notion of a family, of a blended family, yeah. that 
changes it. They're not, they're not just people down the mountain. Right. These are people who are related to him and his family. And you can't tell the family story without mentioning them. No, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Annette. Let's take the opportunity now to field some questions from uh, the audience out there. My colleague, Sandy Brook, who's Avery Director of the Library here at Huntington, is going to field those questions for us. So you'll be hearing her voice uh, quoting questions from the Q&A function. Sandy, welcome. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Professor Gordon-Reed, um, one of the questions from the audience, why is the inclination toward hero worship still, still so strong in our national discourse? And how can we recreate a national history made by amazing, interesting, contradictory, and flawed human beings? Well, I think the impulse to hero worship has probably lessened to some degree in the United States because of, you know, the way history is written now. We're much more, just in general, even in movies, you know, we had heroes in movies. If you look at old movies compared to movies today, we have anti-heroes in some ways. We have people who are, I think, we're, we're more prepared to do that than we were in the past. But the tendency to hero worship is not particularly American. It's not uniquely American. Uh, other countries have figures that they that people fixate upon. I mean, there, I mean, Gordon Wood said that, uh, well, he wondered about this. He said, you know, I don't know that in the UK people care about Pitt, for example, you know, what he thought the prime, you know, that whether that was, um, uh, you know, something that was some figures of the past whom they worship. They do the tutors quite a bit, right, Steve? Yeah. I mean, they, they you could have a whole bookstore full of tutor things. What do you mean? I, I just we do. <laughs> pardon me. What do you mean? Could we? Could do? you do? You do. Okay, you do have them. Um, yeah, I, I think it's sort of human beings who want to. We look up to our parents. We look up to teachers. We look up. We want to believe that there's some. We want to model, um, in in some sort of way. But I I, I think we're that's that's um, subsiding a bit. I mean, from the, if, to be, judging by biographies and so forth people are much more willing to write about the flaws of individuals. Not, this is not to say other people aren't resistant to that, but we're gonna have to do it. You know, we're gonna have to create, uh, to find a different way of dealing with, the, with these people um, because I don't, I don't think hero worship, young people are, are equipped for that, but we have to, we can't, I don't think we can move them off the stage because then you're, you're erasing your past. It's like going back and looking at, you know, school pictures or family pictures and Xing out the people you don't like. No, they were there. Uh, and we have to deal with them. Um, uh, one person asked, in evaluating the principles of a slaveholder, isn't it important to consider how that individual treated their slaves? Um, <laughs> well, yeah, you can consider it, but there's a, there's a floor, I mean, you, you, you can't, uh, there's, there's, there are people who whip slaves all the time, abuse them, made them, you know, drink urine, oh, I'm thinking William Byrd, I mean, you, people like that, um, you can take that into account, but it doesn't absolve them of, of being slave owners. Because that creates a whole different other, that creates another level of, of, um, of problem. I mean, I, I think writing about the Hemings is um, the way Jefferson treated them. On one hand, I, I'm not free to say, oh, I wouldn't, you know, I, I, don't, I think it's meaningless that he treated them well. But it also, I think, created a lot of problems for them, psychological kinds of problems for them, diff other kinds of things. So, yeah, you think about how they treated them, but it doesn't mean that it was okay. How would you reconcile George Washington's contributions to American democracy with his ruthless actions against sovereign indigenous peoples? Well, what's the first part of it? His, his, his contributions to American democracy. Reconcile? Yeah. 
I don't think it has to be, I don't think things have to be reconciled. You know, I mean, you tell both of them, you, you tell the story that this is, that, you know, he contributed to American democracy by walking away, by, you know, leaving the army, by leaving the presidency and saying, you know, somebody else could come after me. That's a contribution. That's an important contribution contribution because the trouble with republics and societies then and now was how do you get from one person to the next? Um, so that's a contribution you recognize. On the other hand, his speculation in the West, Western lands, uh, all those kinds of things. You talk about these things. See, the, the point is not, well, this, I don't know if this is personality or, or what, but the point is not to, to wrap it up so that we have good person, bad person, you know, person who makes sense. Um, it's, this is what he did. And for too long, if you have the sort of, the sort of Parson Weems uh, version of George Washington, left all of that other stuff out, what you have now is you want all of that together. Right. The Washington who was, you know, the, the general the, who brought people together and the Washington who sold people to the West Indies, the Washington who was town destroyer, um, that has to be there. So it's important to recognize the paradoxes and contradictions, isn't it? I mean, yeah. ours, ours is a nuanced enterprise. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I really liked about the Jefferson exhibit at the Museum of African American History is that is the very title of it, The Paradox of Liberty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, is, there are contradictions there that, that cannot be reconciled, but just have to be they're uh, there. Eliminated and explored. They're there. I, I went to... Uh, Christopher Hitchens was a, a friend of mine and he had a, he did a small book about Jefferson and, and he gave a talk at the 92nd Street Y, which I went to see. And when he finished, two men were standing up and they're putting their coats on and one of them turned to the other and said, well, what am I supposed to think <laughs> about him? What am I supposed to think about it? Because, you know, there's all this that's good. There's all this that's bad. What do I think? And it's not... It, it's not a night, it can't be a tidy answer to that at all. Um, someone uh, has asked, how do you answer students when they excuse slaveholding as being, quote, what was done then, as though self-reflection is a modern invention? Well, it's, it's somewhat what I was saying before. You tell them, who are they? I mean, who are the people that you see yourself as when you're reading history, when you're thinking about this? Um, because, you know, sure, slave owners, that's what they did. They had the power to do. But there were other people, and you know from narratives, you know from their actions, you know from them running away, we know all those kinds of things, that those people thought it was wrong and thought that, that their treatment was wrong. And so I would try to get students to think about the, the objects of these actions. I mean, typically, you know, the morality suggests that we, we, pay, we typically pay attention to victims. And there's no question that enslaved people were oppressed and were victims um, during slavery. They did not have the power. They did not have the numbers. There may be some places where there were lots of them and they could have overtaken um, uh, masters or, you know, slave owners in, in one particular place, but overall they were, they were outnumbered. Um, and you have to get students to think, not just see the world, not just through the eyes of the powerful, which is what people tend to do. You know, no, anybody who thinks they had a past life is always Cleopatra. You know, she was always in the, they were always the powerful person in the story. They were never a peasant, you know, you know, mill and grain or whatever. Um, so if you could get students to think about the powerless, to think about the other people, then this notion, well, that's what they did, it changes the calculus. Um, someone says, um, and you've written a, a lot about Jefferson in this, but it says, do you not think that Thomas Jefferson had any change of heart towards slavery, even given his relationship with Hemings and her having had his offspring? Um, 
I think Jefferson always thought slavery was an evil thing. He thought it was a backward thing. But I don't, I, I don't think he had, his solution was there should be emancipation and expatriation. That black people and white people could not live together in peace. Black people would never forgive white people and white people would never give up their prejudices um, against black people. So there would just be turmoil, constant turmoil. And, you know, we sort of scoff at that, but it hasn't been easy. Um, it certainly, it's not easy now. It's what I've been talking about earlier this evening. It has been a constant struggle. I don't think that the Hemings, I don't see any evidence of the Hemings situation changing his attitude about slavery very much. I think he saw it as as an institution that would eventually die out, that he would not be able to, in his lifetime, or in the lifetime of his children or grandchildren, transform Virginians, and that's primarily who he cared about, attitude about the institution. The children he had with Sally Hemings were seven-eighths white. And in Virginia, if you were seven-eighths white, you were white. You were supposed to be white. Now, socially, that's the legal rule. Socially, it would be a problem. Uh, but he writes a letter at one point to a man saying that anybody who was seven-eighths white and who was emancipated would become a free white citizen of the United States. So as far as he was concerned, the children that he had with Sally Hemings were white and that they could live, they could go off and live as white people and be citizens. And that's what three of them did eventually go into the white world and live as white people. And, you know, that's, so I, I don't, I, I don't think he, he had a solution. I think he always thought that slavery was wrong, but I don't, he had no, no practical plan for getting rid of it. And I don't think that changed over, over time. Sort of a related question um, a, from an interesting point of view, a, a person who's a, a, a historical reenactor who takes the part of Thomas Jefferson says, what specific points would you like to see presented to students about Thomas Jefferson? Well, I think particular points of his engagement with the world. I mean, the fascinating thing to me, one of the fascinating things to me about Jefferson, but maybe the most, is a person who d was determined to make himself an actor in the world, to do things in the world. And he set about as a young man to accomplish those things by reading, educating himself, and being curious about the world. Um, that is something that it, I, it, to sort of, and to question too. I mean, he questioned religion. You know, he questioned the social order of his society by becoming a revolutionary. He was an actor. You know, he wanted to ha make things happen. And I think that that, that in, some, in my view is perhaps the most admirable thing about him is his determination to be a figure uh, in the world and to do things, to take the talent that he had and make something of it. And so that's, that's what I, I would want people to that you can convey about him. Um, someone has asked about the 1619 project um, specifically. They said, would you comment on, on it, its contributions and or distortions? Um, the 1619 Project is a lot of things. There were a lot of essays in that volume that were very valuable. I mean, I had a sort of Twitter exchange with uh, the author, um, Nicole Hannah-Jones, about 1776 versus 1619, and I think she was using, she was suggesting rhetorically that 1619 was the real start of the, of, of the United States. Um, and not 1776. And I had a little pushback on that because there was no United States in 1619. The American paradox comes into play when Jefferson writes, 
we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal when they're starting out, you know, breaking from Great Britain to create their own country. But overall, I think it's been a useful thing to start a conversation about slavery, about uh, the, the importance of slavery to forming the American character. Character is not always good things. We think of you have character that that necessarily means good, but <clears throat> but character means who you are. So I, I think I, I applaud it for bringing that to the fore. Uh, the 1776 you know tip that we had going back and forth, and others have had to my mind is less important than the overall message of the centrality of of slavery and race. Uh, to the formation of, of, of the United States. Um, the American Revolution had many causes. I don't think that it was about slavery. Um, Somerset, but these are, these are just details of things. But overall, I, I think it was a useful, it was a useful reminder of the importance of slavery and race. Um. A couple of people have questions about, uh, you mentioned uh, Princeton's and Yale's reckonings with slavery. And they said, are there examples where a community, not necessarily a university, but where a community you think has done a good job of navigating these kinds of difficulties? And if so, how have they done it? Well, Bristol did a really good job of it with Edward Colston. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you mean after they pulled down the statue? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, a community, you know, I actually, I don't know of, of a community. I, I think, um, <clears throat> I think, well, Princeton is interesting because originally they decided to keep it, but then in the wake of George Floyd, as I said, we've had, there are sort of two phases to this. We were talking about this. We've been talking about this since Charleston, actually before Charleston, but Charleston really galvanized the Confederates, and then it went to other kinds of things. Princeton initially said, we've looked at it and no, we're not gonna change anything. And then recently has decided to do something different. I would say, well, I could, I could, maybe I could offer them, Yale and those are communities or the universities. I don't know towns, you know, I, 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 I can't speak about towns or other kinds of communities. All I know is what has happened in in university communities, and those are, are examples of people having talked about it. I think the key is to sit down and to talk and to have differing voices um, involved in, in making these decisions. Um, somebody says, um, I think the decline in Jefferson's reputation certainly began with Professor Gordon Reed's first book and the subsequent uh, DNA cover story in Nature. But I wonder what uh, she thinks about the impact the musical Hamilton has more recently had on his reputation. <clears throat> well, um, he's the best character in the musical. I mean, the energy level goes up 10 times no kidding. <laughs> when he's on. I mean, so, I mean, as a, he's played as a joke. I went to see it with a group of historians. Um, about a month after it went on to Broadway. And of course, when he comes out, everybody turns to look at me like somehow I'm a guardian of this person. I had to see what I was gonna, how I would respond to it. And I thought it was actually, I thought it was funny. Uh, it pokes fun at him. And, you know, it, it isn't a heroic per, you know, portrayal, but it's a great portrayal. He's the best person in the musical. Uh, I mean, he's the most exciting person in the musical, but it certainly hasn't helped. Uh, it hasn't helped any time, I guess, Alexander Hamilton is raised. Uh, people think that Jefferson falls, but Alexander Hamilton, um, that's not really Alexander Hamilton, and it's not really Jefferson. It's, not, well, it's, it's much less Alexander Hamilton, actually, uh, who was le decidedly less, less uh, appealing than Lin-Manuel Miranda as Hamilton. Um, but oh. that's another hit, but it does keep him, it keeps him in the, in the, uh, in the public eye. And 
he will always be, I, you know, I can't imagine him not being in the public eye. His fortunes rise and fall. He's not always been super popular. I mean, there was in the 19th century after the Civil War, he was not super, super popular. It was Hamilton uh, as the progressive built, progressives built the national state and administrative state and so forth. It was FDR, strangely enough, who brings him back um, in the 30s and the 40s. And then, of course, you know, he begins to fade again, but I think it's up and he's always been up and down. And so this is just a period of when he's down and he'll be back up again. So while we're talking about representations of him in popular culture, I was always struck by the very sinister uh, performance that Stephen Delane turned in, in the HBO John Adams. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that, that struck me at the time as a, as a really negative representation of Jefferson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This malevolent spider in the background. Almost. Malevolent spider. Well, Stephen Delane, I mean, Stephen Delane is kind of for people sort of something of a heartthrob. So, I mean, that, that was sort of surprising to me. I wasn't expecting that, that, that kind of portrayal. But yeah, no, I, I think there are mixed views about that one. Right. Um, there was a question about... Um, uh, what prompted you to become a historian? You know, I always loved to read history. I initially thought of myself as a writer, wanting to be a writer, but I found that I just love to read about the past. I started out being interested in, in Egypt. Um, just, there's just something about the past that, that, um, that attracts me and when I was in the third grade, I read a biography about a biography of Jefferson about Monticello. And, and I've told the story. He, he it was narrated by a, a, a slave in a slave boy who was supposed to be Jefferson's friend. And that got me to thinking about a person who writes the declaration of independence, but has slaves, you know, what's up with that? And that sort of shows the way that it, the, the wonderful thing about writing about Jefferson is that you can write about the United States through his life, exemplifies that. The good things, the bad things, freedom, slavery, all of that is contained. I can write about race by writing about him. Now he's interesting, but the world that he lived in and the things that he dealt with, race, slavery, politics, revolution, religion, all of those kinds of things uh, just interested me. And I started this, started reading about all of these things as, as, a, as a kid. And I don't know, it just struck me as history was just, just was alive for me in a way that, uh, that was just very, very meaningful. Someone asked, have you visited the new memorial for enslaved laborers at the University of Virginia? And if so, would you comment on that? I have not. I've not, I've not had a chance to be down there to, to see that. But I'm very, I know all the work that went into it. I think it's, it's a fitting thing to do. It makes, uh, it makes the university, and I'm hoping that someday that there'll be a closer there is a close connection between Monticello and, and UVA, certainly, but those two institutions can do a lot towards, well, reconciliation, but informing people about the institution of slavery and, you know, through the history of both of those places. So I was very excited to see uh, that happen. And I've you know, been going there since when I started writing my, my first book, 1995, 1994, 1995. And it's just been amazing to see how both of those places have taken on this question and uh, made a really valuable contribution to the country. Yeah, it sort of goes to that, you know, the issue we're talking about, about history and, and doesn't equal hero worship, but what is worthy to be in the public square. Mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, um, 
a person writes, why were black people chosen as slaves? And why were we considered inferior to whites? Well, black people were chosen as slaves. Well, there've been other people who've been enslaved as well. Uh, the history of Arab countries using African people as, as slaves, um, people who had guns. You know, at first, you know, it was not possible to go into the interior of Africa to take enslaved people, but there were, and, but it, that was something that came later. At first, it really was people in Africa selling conquered people to Europeans, uh, just as Slavs and people in other parts of the country, other parts of the world had been used as slaves as well. Uh, so the fact that they, you know, that weaponry that could make this possible uh, was one of the reasons. And what's the second part of the question? Um, it was, it was really, it was just, it was that about, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, someone says, what do you think the role is for an institution like the Huntington in preserving and understanding history? Well, it's a great role. I mean, it's, it was described as Karen was talking about before about their, their archives, the things that they have there that allow people to come and study, uh, find out about Jefferson, find out about other people who are, you know, whose archives are there. Um, these kinds of programs. I'm sure you do things with young people, I'm sure you have um, very extensive school programs here. Very ex extensive school okay. programs, things like that. I mean, it's, it's about being a repository of information that's available to people and making that available, leaving, le letting scholars come there for long-term fellowships and work on their books. I've had friends who've uh, been fellows there <coughs> and talked about you know, what a wonderful time it was for them to be able to, you know, to, to research and have the time to write uh, in those places. It's, it's a lot of things that can be done there. It's a great contribution. I'd like to point out that Annette has a standing invitation to hold <laughs> one of our distinguished fellowship here, and I'm just trying to reel her in. <laughs> Get to reel me in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, preferably in a year when we're not having a pandemic. It's yeah, let's do that. Let's, let's do it in a year when I can actually get out there. Uh, um, there's a question about the Confederacy. It says, should the entire group of values that are historically labeled as Confederate be disappeared as a group? because some of those values contaminate, as it were, the rest. Are, uh, and are there Confederate values that should be preserved and credited as being Confederate? Gee, I don't know what they are. I mean, uh, values that are not values that we hold as well. You know, you can have honor from other people. You can have valor, examples of valor from other people. Uh, from other, from the Union soldiers, bravery from the Union soldiers and so forth. It's just that, you know, typically when you lose a war, you don't put up statues to people who lose the war. I mean, that's just the, that's the way it is. You know, you, um, you fold the flag. That's what Robert Lee said to do. You fold the flag and you go home and you start, you come back into the Union and you continue to live your life. No, the value shouldn't, whatever ideas should not be disappeared. We will read about the Confederates and Lee and Stevens and all those people in history. There will always be books about them. They will always be taught about in school. All those kinds of things will be there. It's just about public statues um, in, you know, in public places. That's, I just, to my mind, it isn't even just about, I, I mentioned it before in terms of African Americans, but these were these were flags and people who fought against the United States of America. I mean, one of the things we do now in talking about the Union and the Confederacy, it really obscures what we're talking about. The Union was the United States of America. And, you know, that, that's, to, to, we cannot, to my mind, you know, uh, sort of absolve Confederates on, you know, on, on behalf of dead Union soldiers. I mean, you know, we can't make that decision, to my mind, to, to say that. And so in honoring 
those people, I think we, if we honor Confederates in the same way with public, public monuments, again, not about cemeteries, not about private spaces, not about museums, not about history books, they got to be there. But I think that Union soldiers deserve to be recognized and I think that they, we cannot honor the people who killed them. Of soldiers in the United in the Army of the United States. That's that is something now. That's the sort of the historical trend now is to talk about them as the United States Army because that's what they were. That's what they called themselves. And um, uh, a person in the audience asks, "What do you think would be the most effective extension of reparations that the United States government could make to the descendants of enslaved people?" Well. <laughs> Reparations um, are many, can be, be in many forms. I think the best thing we could do is to enforce the 14th Amendment and to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, make them real, do away with voter suppression, work against voter suppression, uh, equal rights. Reparations, I would confine myself as, as a lawyer and a person who thinks about standing and all the and procedure and those kinds of things. Uh, reparations for things that happened in the 20th century with the Federal Housing Authority, uh, Administration that participated in redlining and segregating communities, uh, contract buying in places where African Americans who could have had enough uh, had good enough credit to get regular loans were forced into situations where they had to do contra use contracts to buy houses. And if they missed a payment, after ever how many years they've been paying, they lost the house. There were th there, in other words, there are things that happened to people who are still alive now for which there could be reparations. So I would start with that rather than thinking about reparations for slavery, for the institution of slavery. That could be something down the line if I, I don't think that that's a likely possibility, but there are people alive today who suffered because of state action, inaction and state action, who could get reparations for that. So I would start with that. So one, one last question, and this is when we're asking the historian to use their um, their historical knowledge to look in their crystal ball. Oh no. <laughs> oh, yeah. So it's, how, how do you see our national conversation on systemic racism evolving? Well, I think, well, it depends on what happens. I think it depends on what happens with the election. Um, my, my crystal ball, if one candidate wins, we could have more, we could continue to have more divide. Well, if, if either one wins, we're in for a period of real strife, I think, because of some of the forces that have been unleashed. Some of the things that have been said, things that were sort of tamped down that I thought I would never see, um, we've seen. And it's gonna be hard to put that genie back in the bottle. I think we're in for, uh, some serious conversations <laughs> with people. I hope, I hope not violence. I hope that people, we can talk across our differences. Um, so I, I will amend that to say what, whoever wins, I, I think we're in for some difficult times and tough times. And it may be necessary to, you know, to come through this, but the conversation has started and, I, and I'm hoping that it will continue and continue in a way that will be productive and not destructive. So that's exactly why conversations like this are so very important. And thank you, Annette, for participating and for sharing your expertise and insights so generously. So as thank we draw the program me. to a close, we'd like to offer an appreciation of the generosity, vision and leadership of Dennis and Susan Shapiro. As you heard earlier, one of the key contexts for the creation of the centre is Dennis's personal commitment to collecting, and it is entirely appropriate that his friend and fellow collector and editor most recently of Conversations with Historians, David Rubenstein, has agreed to offer this tribute. 
Hello, I'm David Rubenstein. I'd like to speak to you tonight about two friends of mine, Dennis and Susan Shapiro. Over the years, I've come to know them initially through my father-in-law and then later through the Library of Congress's Madison Council, where they've been very active supporters. I want to congratulate them on their enormous gift to the Huntington Library. The Huntington Library is a real national treasure. And now that it has the Center on American History and Culture, and also has the documents that Dennis and Susan Shapiro have put together over many years, the Huntington Library is even going to be a richer place for scholars to spend time. I hope when the pandemic is over, I can visit the Huntington Library in person, as I've done before, but now I'll be able to see the great documents that Dennis and Susan Shapiro have given. So let me congratulate them for what they're doing to remind people of American history and what they're doing to be what I call great patriotic philanthropists. Dennis and Susan, thank you very much for what you've done for the Huntington Library, and thank you very much for what you've done for our country. So in light of those generous words and of this inaugural program as a whole, I wonder, Dennis and Susan, whether you'd like to take this opportunity to make some comments or remarks. I want to say greetings to the friends, colleagues, and family who are virtually with us to, to see Annette Gordon-Reed and to celebrate the inaugural program of the Shapiro Center for American History and Culture. Susan and I thank Annette for her outstanding presentation and David Rubenstein for his personal tribute. But most of all, we wish to thank the Huntington and its extraordinary staff for opening our eyes to the importance of the center and its impact on strengthening the library's position as a major research center. We look forward to a continuing stream of thought provoking programs, productive fellowships and landmark book awards. I am delighted that the Shapiro Collection, for which I worked to accumulate and curate over many years, has now found a permanent home. For me, the letters offer a unique window into US presidents. George Washington wrote one of my favorites. As this sitting president was riding his horse from Mount Vernon to Philadelphia, he happened by a ship bound from England, and he decided to put in his seed order. His instructions as to how the seed should be packed are extraordinarily detailed and made me realize, wow, George Washington was a micromanager. One, one cannot find that stuff in history books. I am delighted that Dennis's letters have found a home at the Huntington, where many, many people will be gave able to get to know our presidents in the president's own words. Thanks to the Huntington for hosting this event and thank you all for attending. Assembled guests, um, thank you so much for joining us this evening and Susan and Dennis, thank you for those words. Um, I'm Sandra Brook, I'm the Avery Director of the Library, the Huntington. Um, Professor Gordon Reed, thank you so much for an insightful and inspiring presentation. It was truly a wonderful launch to all the promise of the Shapiro Center. And Dennis and Susan, I extend heartfelt thanks uh, to both of you on behalf of the Huntington and on behalf of generations to come for your vision and your true generosity. We are all beholden to you. And to everyone who's been in the audience with us this evening, the work of the Shapiro Center for American History and Culture is underway. And we invite you all to join us again in the spring for the awarding of the inaugural Shapiro Book Prize. So if we were in person at this point, we would all repair to the beautiful Huntington Gardens for a, um, a wonderful reception and a, ce a celebratory toast. So uh, in this kind of virtual world that we find ourselves in, I would ask that you please join me in lifting a glass of amity and thanks to Dennis and Susan Shapiro. And now to all assembled to paraphrase George Washington, it is with a heart full of love and gratitude 
that we now take leave of you. Good night, everyone, and thank you again.